Okay, have, have a look at the picture up front. Do you know where it is leading to? Do you, do you know where that thing is leading to? No. no. Okay, do you know where this class is going to? Huh? How do you know? It could stop somewhere? Invisible island. Invisible island. Okay, so just as you are not clear where that is heading to, you have got no idea where this class is heading to, right? So I want to share with you a quote from Epictetus. He says, it is impossible for a man to learn what he thinks he already know. Okay, so just have an open mind. If you disagree with what I say, have a, have a conversation with me, challenge me. Okay, so with that, I've been asked to talk to you about innovation. My name is Edwin Chung. I used to be the deputy dean after, uh, looking after the school. Uh, now I look after something else. Uh, le let me start. Definition. What is innovation? What is innovation in your opinion? Making something better. Okay. Making something better. Anyone else have got a different opinion? Sorry? I, I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, thinking of new solution. Is that right? Okay. Anyone else have got an, op an opinion that's different? To engineer something creatively. To engineer something creatively. Anyone else? To invent new things. To invent new things. Anyone else? No? Yes? To re-engineer something. Yeah, it's impossible. Anyone else? Im improvising. So, improvising all the products. Is that right? Someone else? It's application of new technologies in different fields of engineering. Okay, so application of something all? Is that, is that what you say? Application of something all in, in, in a new area? Did you say it's an application of something all in a new area, is that right? I, I can't hear you. So it's um, application of new solution that meets requirements okay. for different category of fields. In of oh, so, so application in one, one industry in another industry? Not totally from one industry to another industry. It can be like, um, for example, if we're building the robot and we need to add like electronic and mechanicals. So okay. like different field in one specific project. Application? Yeah. So, yeah. so are you saying multi-discipline into one? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So application of multi-discipline in a solution. Anyone else? Now, I'm going to show you a video. This video is taken of um, delegates that come into a conference. And everyone was asked a question, what is innovation? And that's how they define it, okay? Now, all these guys are in a, in a consortium called LITC, Learning Innovation and Technology Consortium. They believe that if you teach any community innovation and technology, they'll know how to look after themselves. Okay? So just watch. Innovation is 
the great idea that you didn't know you were waiting for. What's central to this problem solving? Where you look past the typical sorts of solutions to problems. It's more like an idea or a goal that's expanded and it happens to become a service. We tend to live in a world, at least I think so, where people say, well, it's just always been done that way, but it hasn't always been done that way. Think of people that had a passion and had an idea. People who forget about the rules. Someone who's not afraid to fail. Being able to look at all sides of a problem with a unique solution. It's taking a lot of pre-existing parts, mashing them up creating a new use for something that hadn't been done before. It actually creates potential for others. The creation of, of new ideas. You have to see that you can find a solution. You're just perpetually innovating by, you know, by moving forward, by figuring out how, how do I get to the next step. We haven't scratched the surface of innovation. It's gotta be something that's good for all of us. Then it's innovative. Here it is, and, and you can do this too. We all can create this thing. Let's go. Does that help? Are you clearer what innovation is after this? So the, the last guy, he defined innovation as, here it is, we, you can do this, let's go. What is that? What is, here is this? Single hand. Huh? A single hand. So if I say, let's, let's go innovate, all of you do this. <laughs> right? And you notice that every single one of them has got multiple definition of innovation, right? Now, if I'm your CEO, then I say, let's go innovate. And each one of you, with whatever belief of innovation, you think it is, you will go and do that. And then we would not have strategic alignment. You'll be like me saying go and you guys going boof all over the place. Make sense? So the, it is actually very important to define what innovation is. Okay, so let's go to the dictionary. Merriam Webster, Webster. It says this, the introduction of something new. A lot of you guys mentioned new. So it's, where is it? Uh, new, there's something new here new here so new is mentioned all the time right so it said it's a new idea a new method a new device okay now an example of some usages of the word innovation she is responsible for many innovation in her field so it's like she's responsible for many new things in her field the latest new thing in computer technology through technology and new process new device new methodology they found ways to get better solution and less work does it work? Does it help you? Yes? So, let's try. Have you heard of Samsung Yums? It is a flexible screen. Yes? Innovative? Yes? So you find this innovative. Okay? So, you see, it is so good that you could curve your display and you could read something on the edge of the phone. So it's no longer on this surface, but it's on the edge. So even when your phone is closed, you could actually read on the side when the message is coming through. Interesting, right? So innovative? Yes. yes. Oh, great. What about this? Is this innovative? No. It's an old color te television. No? Innovative? He says no. Anyone disagree with him? You disagree. So you think it's innovative? Why? Say more? New at, new at, the, time. New at the time. Yeah. OK, great. So and, yeah, it led the path on. to what we have now. Very good. Uh, hang on to that thought. So for those of you who say that it is not innovative, imagine at that time, just like what he's saying, you only have this. And then someone say, hey, I can give you this. At that point in time, do you think this is innovative? Yes. yes. So it is innovative. So then innovation is something new at the time. Something new at that time is innovation. Is that right? So we say something new. Dictionary say it's something new, right? And now you say even that old television is innovative at that time. So, it, something new at that time is innovation. Would it be a better definition? Yes? Okay. So, this was, this is, uh, what is this? Proton what? Suprema S, right? Release, release uh, last month. It's new. This is new, okay? So this is new at this time. Is it innovative? Yes. yes? Why? Why? How is this innovative? So how, how is this innovative? This car, this car, so any, you can, you can, you, well, okay, so you say new, so it's innovative. 
you look at this car, this car is comp competing with VW Golf, competing with uh, Peugeot 308, competing with uh, Ford Focus. So is this innovative when you compare to those other cars? No, so this is not innovative. No? Okay, so what about this car? Release only, okay, why is it innovative? Why? Huh? So, so the, the shape, the shape is new. The, the moment the shape is new, it is innovative. Huh? Newer facelift. Face lift. So, so I can also say, yeah, the, the hatchback portion is new from Privé, so it should be innovative, right? Yes, no? Yes. So both are innovative, or both are not innovative. Okay, so let me let me show you let me show you what this car is capable of, okay? Over 95% of the world uses gas and diesel combustion engines now. And even by 2020, 90% still will be. That leaves only 10% using alternatives. Cars that run on electric, hydrogen, corn, or even french fry oil have potential. And we're working on alternatives too. But the solutions most car makers have come up with so far either offer up the driving exhilaration of a couple squirrels on a treadmill, or are so expensive they're just not realistic for most people. To really affect global fuel consumption and emissions right now, you have to use something the globe actually uses right now. Rethink the combustion engine. Make it better and accessible to everyone, and you'll make a difference. A big difference. How big? Consider that current combustion engines waste about 70% of the fuel's potential energy. That's a lot of room for improvement. Our overall goal is to get 15% better fuel economy and a 15% improvement in low mid-range torque from the same engine, all on regular fuel. Two 800-pound gorillas stood in our way. The first was figuring out how to capture more energy from the fuel. To do that, we needed to raise the compression ratio by placing a dome on each piston. Because the more you squeeze the air-fuel mixture, the more energy you get from the combustion. But a high compression ratio usually ends up causing knock, which is when the air-fuel mixture ignites too soon because it's too hot inside the chamber. And that's no good. So we had to cool things off. Using some huge engineering muscle, we came up with innovative solutions to do just that. Like a high-pressure, six-hole direct fuel injector that fires gasoline into the cylinder at 3,000 PSI to help keep it cool. And a volcano-like pocket in the piston that improves combustion efficiency, giving burning fuel a place to grow without wasting energy heating the top of the piston. To get all that hot exhaust out without it shooting into the other cylinders, we added a longer exhaust manifold used in race cars called a header. Everyday cars don't use headers because of the emission problems they create, but our advanced direct injection system solved that issue too. That's how we got more energy from the fuel. The second gorilla was making sure we weren't losing any of that precious booty on its way to the wheels, so we reduced friction inside the engine by a whopping 30%. How? By sweating every little detail. We've improved oil pump efficiency by 74% and water pump efficiency by 31%. Reduced friction from the big bouncy bits like the pistons, rods, and crankshaft by 25% reduced valve train friction by 54%, and even reduced the effort the engine exerts to suck in fresh air by 13%. When it was all over, we had done what couldn't be done, achieving more torque, better performance, and higher efficiency. Skyactive technology from Mazda. The future of driving begins now. We build Mazdas. What do you drive? So it's a, so it's a second car that has got this technology innovative now? Yes. Yes. What about the first one? What about Proton? So you're going to ask, what does it have, right? So can we change the definition to be there, must be, there must be really something new inside that's special, that is innovation. Can we change it to something like that? Bet better definition? Yes, no? OK. So let's look at this. iPod. Ignore the iPhone. Look at the iPod. Innovative? You see, your mind has learned that I'm going to trick you, right? So you are hesitating to answer it right now. <laughs> Isn't it? Innovative? Yes. yes. Okay. It, it is considered so innovative that it has, changed, it has changed the music industry, right? You know, if, my, if this is my regular class, if you've got a phone call, you have to answer, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is innovative, right? It's innovative, right? Do you know that this is not, not the first digital music player? This is the first commercial music player. 
by a Korean company. 1997. Okay, so it's not new, but we all consider it innovative. So what happened to that new word right now? Huh? So you, you have, it has to have something creative. Okay, is that what you're, what you're trying to say? So by the way, this is not the first idea for a digital player. This is a guy by the name of uh, Ken Kramer, 1979, has a prototype for a digital player that looks like the initial iPod. And when someone sued Apple, Apple took Ken Kramer to the court and said, I invented this. So Apple admit that they took the design from Ken. Now, not only did Ken Kramer come up with the device itself, he described the IXI system that is very much like the iTunes today. Okay? So the iTunes iPod is not new, and yet we consider it innovative. So, so how now? What happened to our definition? So iPod, iTunes, everyone consider it very innovative. Okay? But it's not new. What now? The fridge. Innovative? Huh? No, he says no. So someone says yes. So if you say no, if those of you who think that it is not innovative, think of a time that there is no refrigerator right now. There is no technology. Okay. <laughs> so that time it, was, it is innovative. What about now? Now it's not. So imagine, imagine now that, that we, have got, we don't have the knowledge for refrigerator. What would happen? Then if someone gives you this, it is innovative, right? So can we, can we define uh, innovative or innovation as something that is, it remains innovative until someone discovers something new? Is it okay? Is, is that a better definition? So you, something is innovative until something uh, supersedes it. Is it okay? That's okay. So what about this? Is this innovative? No? Yes? yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you all learned the trick. You're going to say yes to everything, right? <laughs> but seriously, do you think this is innovative? Yes. yes? Why? Huh? Okay. It never got upgraded. I can, oops, wrong way. I can have a digital laser distance measure. I could point and wherever I hit, it will tell me the distance between this back end to, to that distance. So it's superseded, right? So that measuring tab is no longer innovative. Is that right? Yes. Agree? So the measuring tab has been superseded. It's no longer innovative, right? Okay? So try, try, try. Why am I going the wrong way? Try and measure this. <laughs> try measure this with a laser meter. How? I don't know. How? Because that's a straight line, right? This, is, this, this requires a curve. Okay, so what now? How do you define innovation? I want you guys, I need you guys to be all confused. Are you confused? Yes. Very confused, good. So let's, let's go to another, exa another example. Have a look at this. And you tell me if it is innovative or not. You're watching the video edition of Automotive TV. If Michelin have their way, tyres for the future will not require any air. In fact, the tyre and the wheel will evolve as one and be known as the Twheel. The Twheel is the name of the revolutionary design from the company who invented the radial tyre, Michelin. For several years, Michelin have been developing the Twheel concept and as Automotive TV found out, the applications for the design are limitless. The twheel structure itself is relatively simple. We have rubber compounds in the tread band, as well as some cable reinforcement. Then we have a polyurethane uh, compound for the spokes, and then we have an aluminum wheel. But then once it's all made, it really is one single component. It's one mounted assembly. 
And you can compare this to uh, the current pneumatic tire in which we have basically five components. First you have the tire, then you have the wheel. You have to have air, you have a valve, and now we're adding a pressure monitor. So basically what we've invented here is one mounted assembly, which is one component that replaces five components. With the new invention, we don't have to worry about uh, air inflation pressure. We don't have to worry about uh, uh, retention, bead unseating. That gives us a, a great deal more design freedom. We can have a, a flexible wheel. Uh, we have complete technical control between uh, the, everything that's between the, the axle and the ground. Owners of skid steer loaders lose productivity daily due to flat tires. Wheels will eliminate this problem because of their damage tolerance while providing the compliance, comfort, and mobility of pneumatic tires. And they'll do that without weighing as much as the equivalent solid tires often used in these applications. Uh, they can also, it turns out, give better wear life, better comfort, and machines can actually work faster. Today we're on the second loop of field testing with wheels with real customers and we've tested them in uh, the US, in France, in Italy, in the Netherlands. So after the first loop we fixed the problems that the customers found with the wheels and we're running a second loop to see what new problems they might find. The US military has recently begun organizing new combat formations that make extensive use of wheeled vehicles. The key characteristic of wheels in military applications is their lack of a single point failure mode. Wheels can suffer multiple penetrations from bullets or artillery fragments and can continue to provide adequate mobility. Perhaps the most surprising capability of wheels is their ability to survive and continue to work despite being exposed to direct blast effects. When exposed to the 250 gram TNT equivalent of the largest anti-personnel mines, wheels continued to work. And when they were doing that, they also directed the blast energy of the landmine away from the vehicle, unlike other solutions where the blast energy comes up through the tire and is deposited into the vehicle and its occupants. Military vehicles using our wheel technology will be more effective, less costly, and more capable of completing their missions than any other solution uh, available in the marketplace today. In order to better understand the future blocking points, we've gone ahead now to take a look at how the twill would do on today's Audi A4. The Audi application for twills is really a stretch application. All our applications to this point have been slow speed, low speed applications, but the Audi, of course, is a high speed application, very demanding automotive application. So one of our objectives was to see if we could reach the mass and rolling resistance levels of a pneumatic tire. And these twills are within about 5% of the pneumatic tire levels, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Innovative? Very innovative. Very, right? Okay, what about what about this next one?
So what, what, what about this? <laughs> it's something new, so is it innovative? Yeah. Yes? This is innovative? Okay. <laughs> okay. So so you not you notice that uh, you say this is innovative, this is innovative, this is innovative, you say both this is innovative, you also consider this innovative, you are not too sure about this, and you say this is innovative. <laughs> yes? Okay, so so what is innovation? Can I confuse you some more? What's it? Creativity, innovation, and invention. The same, different, or related? Related. How? How are they related? How? Okay, so you guys are going to say something like, Creativity leads to invention and invention to innovation or creativity leads to invention that leads to innovation or things like that, right? <laughs> is, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. So is, is that how it is related? Yes, no? So let me, let me, give, you, let me give you a possible, def possible set of definition for this guy. Uh, by the way, there's going to be a test, I was told. So you might as well pay attention now. Um, you can define creativity generally as the ability of the individual teams or organization to create ideas that has got value. Okay? And then uh, invention to, to be the action of, of finding or discovering something that was not previously known. And innovation as the thoughtful act of transforming creative ideas and invention into tangible form that's got, that creates value. Now the key, the key words here is that it creates value. Okay? Now, if you, if you were to study the literature for the innovation world, at some point in time, you would come to this realization that innovation is the creation of value, dot, dot, dot. I say dot, dot, dot simply because we argue amongst ourselves. We, say, we will say things like innovation is the creation of value through the implementation of ideas. Some will say no, it's the creation of value through something else. So that dot, dot, dot portion, we cannot agree, but we all agree that it's about the creation of value. So today, I believe that innovation is the creation of value. I don't care what you do it, how you do it, as long as it's legal, it is morally correct, just do it. I, and it creates value, that's, that's good enough. That's innovation. So, let, let, me give you, let me give you some example or a feel of what is innovation like, okay? Um, in 2006, Boston Consulting did Boston Consulting Group did a survey and they took the 25 most innovative company in the world during that time and they studied the profit margin. You know what is profit margin? Profit margin is that if I sell something at this price but it cost me this much, the margin that I make, that's profit margin, okay? So what they did was they, they, they looked at the 25 most innovative company, look at the profit margin of the company for the last 10 years and they found that, they, that those 25 companies have got a profit margin growth year to year by 3.4%. So every year the profit margin keep growing by 3.4%. But if they look at the S&P 1200 company, this is globally good companies anyway, it only grow by 0.4%. Okay, so when you create value, it ends up in your profit margin. It shows up in your profit margin. So when you create value, it, you got extra money, so how do you do with it? So it shows up literally in your profit margin. Okay? Let me share, let me share one with one, another one with you. This is Apple stock, pri stock price, the blue one. The red one is NASDAQ. Do, do, you know, do you guys know what is NASDAQ? It's a comp NASDAQ. NASDAQ is the composite index where they took the electronics or the high-tech company in the US and the average price share, uh, share price of this company is then used to indicate the red one, NASDAQ. So the red color one represents the performance of the, company, the technology company in the US. And the blue one is Apple. Now Apple, if I were to draw it until today, it's somewhere up here, comes down, somewhere here. Okay? So what this means is that because they create value, people then say, hey, gee, this is a good company, it's making money, they'll buy shares in it. So when more people want to buy shares in it, the, the share price goes up. Okay? And this is how they do it. Year 2003, shortly after they released the iPod, the contribution of iPod to the revenue of Apple is a tiny little bit, small little bit. The following year, it increased some more. Okay? Now, if, if you take iPod 
out of the picture that if there's no iPod, they didn't introduce iPod. This is what Apple shares, uh, Apple revenue would have been, which means that they are only selling CPU. Okay, but because of a new product, that new product start contributing revenue into the company. Four years down the road, it is like more, almost 50-50. So that the new thing that you do, the, the innovative thing that the company do, ends up generating revenue for the company. Okay, so when we say create value, we are talking about things like this. Okay, now when I say innovation, when I use the word innovation, the first thing that goes to your head is that it's about product and services, right? So it's either that stupid box or a refrigerator or that measuring tab or whatever. So you're only thinking about products, right? But innovation falls into 10 areas. Okay, this is defined by a company called Dublin, the 10 types of innovation. The first one is product and services. Now, in, in terms of products, it can be product in terms of product performance, which means that I innovate in the area. Whatever I do with my product is all about performance. This comes to mind. So whatever they do is always about product and it's all about, all always about product performance, how the, the uh, product perform. Uh, or it could be about product system. You look at Microsoft Office, it has got many, many products, right? But how each one of these products work together. So it's a product system. Okay? The other one is service. Um, you, can, you can look at uh, Singapore Airlines as service. So when, sing when, you when you become a customer of S uh, Singapore Airlines, pre-flight, during flight and post flight. So the time you come into the system to the time you leave the system, they treat you like king and queen. That's the reason why they are ranked number one in the world in terms of service for many years running right now. Okay? You can also look at Starbucks as someone that innovates in this area. Okay? So beyond that, you can also innovate in the area of service. Uh, and in the area of process, sorry, in the area of process, you have got both enabling process and core process. Now let me talk about uh, core process. You know, you know who Walmart is? Walmart is like the Tesco, the giant of or Kafu in the US. But, but much, much bigger than Kafu or Tesco or, or giant, okay? Now for a, for a retail store like that, you would expect them to have a warehouse somewhere, right? And so when the retail outlet say, in some place says, I need Colgate or I need whatever, they'll send from the store, right? But Walmart do not have a store. They, they have got no warehouse. The way it works is that they have got this thing called a cross-docking station. Trucks comes in in a day, in the morning, through one side of the cross-docking station. Trucks line up on the other side of the cross-docking station. Products leave the truck on one side and it's distributed through to the, to the different trucks on the other side. And once the trucks are filled up, they leave and they go straight to the retail store. So there's no need to store them. There's no need for storage. And because there is no need for this big warehouse, the cost incur to build this warehouse and maintain the warehouse is gone. So you got, when you don't have that cost, the savings go straight to the customer. That's the reason why they are very price competitive. Understand? So you can, you can innovate in the area of your core process. Now, you, you can also innovate in the area of your enabling process. Starbucks, you know them as good service, right? Good experience. But when they first start their business, the survey shows that they are really very poor in terms of customer service. And what they found is that the guys serving don't understand customer service. How many of you here work at Starbucks? Yeah, okay, two, three maybe. Uh, those of you who work at Starbucks, do you, do you know of uh, um, people who are non-students who are working there as well? Yes? But those tend to be like full-time staff at the bank, right? But the guy who serves tends to be part-time staff like you guys, students, right? Why is there no, why can't they go and hire uh, uh, someone from Indonesia or Myanmar? Why, why don't they do that? Why do they hire part-time students? So the idea, the idea here is this. Part-time students tend to be better educated than someone from uh, 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 Indonesia or Myanmar, right? And when you are, high, you are better educated, then what happens is that you understand what service is and then you can provide good service to the customer. Okay? So if they hire someone from Myanmar who has got either no education or very little education, do not understand service, very hard to teach them what is service, and then cannot provide good service. So what they do, the enabling portion is that they, they hire people like part-time students, they pay better, yes, they pay a lot better, uh, well, slightly better. So because of that, then, then it allows the staff to provide better service. Okay, so you can innovate in that kind of area as well. In the other area is finance. So let me talk about, let me talk about Dell for, for, for a moment. Many years ago, 
uh, Dell is a company that you can buy something, you say you can specify the parts that you want. Uh, specify your credit card number and they take your money and one, two weeks later, your machine arrive. Okay? Your PC arrive. Or your laptop arrive. At the time that you place the order, the parts that is needed to build your machine is not even in Dell yet. It is in the supplier's factory somewhere. Okay? So, Dell has to think of a way in terms of their core processes to allow all this product to go through supply chain and all those things to arrive at their factory right on time so that they can assemble it and then deliver it to you within 7 days, 14 days or whatever the case may be. Okay? Now, why is this uh, an innovation in the business model? The time they take your money, they swap your money, and that is like two weeks before they give you a machine or even one week before they give you a machine. Then they pay the supplier. So the moment you say you want something, they'll order the item with the supplier. Okay? Then they'll pay the supplier probably something like 60 days later. So from the time they take your money to the time that they pay the supplier, it's like 60 days. So you can imagine this 60 days worth of millions of dollars, right? What, can it, what, what, what would you do with it? Even if you were to take this money and put it in the bank, you'll make money. Make sense? Very clever, right? No, it's not dangerous. It's very clever. <laughs> okay? Uh, or, or this. Do you guys know this? Sarah Lee? Yes, no? No? Okay, so I can't find... I was told to find a Malaysian equivalent. I cannot find a Malaysian equivalent. Uh, they make cheesecakes, croissants, frozen. Okay, you can buy you can buy you can buy them here, you can buy them here. But they don't have a factory here in Malaysia at all, and yet they could produce this. How do they do it? They have alliance with a factory in Malaysia. So, for instance, if you if you have a product, uh, I don't know, Kaya maybe, and then you want you you're not going to ship it from here to Australia, for instance, right? Because by the time it arrived there, it's it's probably expired. So what you would do is that you work with someone over there with a factory that can produce Kaya for you. Okay, so that's what this is about. The next one is delivery. I think you guys are too young. Do you know who Martha Stewart is? Martha Stewart? No, yes? Cooking, cooking show. Okay, so you, you do know. Okay, so Ma Martha Stewart has got a magazine, has got a cooking show, has got a talk show, has got all kind of radio show. What she's doing is that she's finding a way to channel product to the customer. So she's got show, she's got magazine, she's got radio, she's got all kind of stuff, right? And what people would do is that if they've got product to sell, don't have a channel, they work with her. Work with her business. And then her business would then channel products to the customer. So it's a website, talk show, magazine, what have you. Yeah? Uh, so you can innovate in that area as well. Uh, vodka or Absolute. Vodka is Russian, Absolute is Swedish. Okay? Anyone try this before? Huh? Oh, no, you won't admit? Okay. So, so those, who, those who have tested this tells me that it is not good vodka, vodka, but it is beautiful bottle. So those guys, it's only for the bottle. The bottle looks very, very nice. Uh, I, the, the last time I conduct a training like this and uh, someone said, I have bottles. I said, did you drink it? I said, no, it's only for the bottle. So it's like he buys the bottle, throw it away and then keep the bottle. <laughs> so it's, it's all about branding. Okay? Harley Davidson, it's all about how the customer feel using the product. So Harley Davidson would, ha would have got events where people, all those guys that cover their head with a handkerchief and uh, wear leather stuff would come together and um, enjoy themselves. Okay? So that, these are the 10 areas of innovation. So this company, Dublin, sells database. What they do here is this, say for instance, if my industry is uh, education, I'll buy the database for education. Then you'll show me in which area are everyone working on. Say for instance, if a lot of people are working in this area, I might want to work in this area. I'll, I'll work in this area as well, but I'll, I'll focus on something else that no one else is looking at. So they sell database like that. Okay? Question? Are we okay? Yes. Good. So, what is the definition for innovation? Don't know? It's the creation of value, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so I don't care what you put in as dot, 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 as long as it is legal and it is morally just. 
Okay, so innovation is nothing more than the creation of value, and the creation of value for a company usually shows up in your profit margin. Now, for a long time, uh, I've been teaching design, and uh, those guys in the se your seniors tend to make a few mistakes. So, and I was thinking I should use this opportunity to tell you guys what those mistakes are, so that when you go to year one, year two, year three, year four, you don't repeat those mistakes. Okay, the first one is this. Know him? Do you know him? Yes. yes. What does he do all the time? He just runs runs around after someone, right? Huh? He tends he tends to walk off the air until he realizes that there is nothing there. Then he falls, right? So before he realizes that there is nothing on the ground, he continues to walk in air, right? Agree? Yes. Okay. So a lot of us actually do this. <laughs> what do I mean? Sometimes you, when you say things, you say things with got no basis, but you are so adamant that your work, that you continue to talk like that, you continue to believe like that. So it's the same as you walking off the cliff and you're still walking on the air, right? Until you realize whatever you're saying has got no basis and you, then you fall off. Then you say, okay, it doesn't work. So essentially what I'm trying to tell you is when you speak with basis, it's like you are standing on firm ground. And when you speak with no basis, it is as though you are in the air. So whatever you say, there must be a basis behind things that you say. So you're proposing an idea. You're proposing a concept to your team. There must be a basis behind it. If you're, if you're not having any basis behind it, you are coyote walking off the, air, walking off the cliff. Okay? Rem remember this. So... I'll bet that a lot of you, from year one all the way to year three, maybe year, sorry, year, year two, semester three, probably semester four, you design things the way you feel. Oh, it's, it's okay, I just use this idea, or let's do this, let's do that. Um, what I'm asking you to do is fight that tendency to just do it your way. There's always a design process, and follow the design process, okay? Let, let, me, let me share some experience with you. Um, I worked many years as a design engineer. I design ICs that goes into PCs that goes into mobile phone. Okay, so the NEC 3G mobile phone, one of the chips inside, I was involved in that design. Um, there, is a, there, there is a design methodology that we have to follow. I cannot say, oh gee, today I feel like doing it this way. And I, I cannot do that. There's a set flow, set methodology that I must follow. Why? When I say the chip is good, the design is good, and I say tap out. Tap out means that it's done, we send it to the factory, factory is going to print us those devices, right? The moment I say tap out, the company fork out something like 250 million US just to get the tool set, must set we call it, okay? Now if, I, if I'm not sure, if I don't follow the design process, and if I'm not sure, it got, I tap out, 250 million, actually it's more now. 250 million is like 10 year old price. Uh, if something goes wrong, I'm dead. If I follow the design process, even if something goes wrong, I follow the process. Right? It's a process that we all agree upon. So try and learn to design things with a process in mind. Okay? So now year one, semester one, you'll be taught a design process. Majority of your seniors ignore it. They just go with the gut feel. I, I would ask you guys to go talk to your lecturer and say, what, do you, what does each one of these steps mean? Teach me. Okay? If you do not know the steps, you won't follow it. Okay? The, second, the, the next one, the next one is this. Every time you have an idea, every time you get the very first idea, you hang on to it and you do not dare let go. It's as though you cannot find another idea. You feel like this. It's as though you're up in the air. If, if you were to let go, you feel as though you're up in the air, you've got nothing left, right? But the moment you have an idea, you have an idea already. Be daring enough to do like him. Go out, explore other ideas, and whichever the other ideas is better, the, the first one could be a good idea, keep it. If the first one is not a good idea, take whatever is a good idea. Okay? So there, there are three things that I really want you guys to do. Follow the design process, speak with basis, don't, don't be like coyote. Number three, be daring enough to let go of whatever ideas you have to explore other ideas. Okay?